good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Gioia Zenoni, and I'm glad uh, to have uh, today here with us uh, Dr. Emanuela Sebastiani, uh, that is um, a language and humanitarian interpreting training coordinator for the in-zone program of the University of Geneva in Switzerland, uh, to have a talk for Young Flo uh, about uh, um, a very specific topic. The, um, the subject is uh, public archaeology for displaced communities. And uh, today we'll debate um, on how uh, we can mix uh, two uh, different academic subjects, uh, archaeology and humanitarian studies, uh, to play a role in these days the, where the world is changing so quickly. We have uh, civil wars everywhere, uh, migration of people, serious problems in the field of education that are exasperated by the pandemic. And so, uh, moving from a, a common experience that we developed through a research project on Syrian refugees, we will uh, thus explore the social and uh, institutional framework in which education and training projects for young refugees can develop. And uh, we will question how archaeology can be a maiotic tool at the service of refugee communities. Uh, archaeology, in fact, uh, through understanding the, the past, helps us to understand who we are, where we come from, and also where we are going. So, uh, in a few words, uh, archaeology can be a compass that allows us to orient ourselves in the present. And in this perspective, uh, especially for refugees uh, um, from fleeing the war, um, the comparison uh, between archaeological heritage of their, the, the country of their or origin um, is a valuable tool to imagine and to build the future from their own roots. And uh, this is, is also very important uh, concerning the um, topic of the interpretation of memory, because memory could be uh, a, a source for a new cultural production that marks the continuity between past, present, and future. So first of all, I introduce myself. Uh, I am the project manager of the Human Lab of the Department of Humanities. And uh, I'm an, an archaeologist. I am specializ uh, specialized in classical archaeology. Uh, and um, I worked for several years in Syria and in the Middle East in general, where I, per uh, I participated to the first Italian archaeological mission in uh, Palmyra, a mission that was interrupted by the civil war more than 10 years ago. And uh, now I'm working in Ulm uh, on communication projects for our archaeological sites and museums and uh, on multimedia products such as uh, uh, documentaries, websites, uh, digital exhibitions and uh, interactive apps. Uh, Ulm University is empowering the research in the field of heritage education and um, on research aim to make cultural heritage a mean for cons constructing peace. And um, I must say thank you to our International Affairs Office, the, directed by Roberto Razzetto, that is working hard on this topic and uh, also uh, is interested in um, continuing the collaboration with the, the University of Geneva, of course. Um, in the last three years, uh, the Human Lab, where uh, I'm working, and uh, that is directed by Professor Giovanna Rocca, developed many initiatives um, to offer the results of the field researches on Palmyra to a wider public. Uh, first of all, we um, developed a digital exhibition named The Extraordinary Stories of Palmyra that was devoted to the memory of the professor Maria Teresa Grassi, and uh, that was inspired by her book. And uh, this exhibition that was realized with Fondazione Terra Santa uh, and uh, was supported by the network of the Italian universities uh, for peace is uh, still accessible to the public. Uh, and uh, maybe later I will share with you uh, the link to this exhibition. 
And then uh, this exhibition has been transformed in a physical one. So uh, we can, you <laughs> would see it uh, in many museums uh, of uh, Lombardy uh, from the autumn on. Uh, we also produce some video pills on the monuments of uh, Palmyra that are available on daily motion. So this is uh, the general framework we are working on now. Uh, then uh, during uh, our path, we, we, we uh, met uh, Dr. Emanuela Sebastiani from the ISON project of the University of Geneva. And, uh, with the in zone, uh, Emanuela is responsible for the language training program, which includes uh, the English and French language uh, pathways, mm, of course. And uh, uh, as a practicing conference interpreter, Emanuela uh, is one of the co authors of the rapid response module for humanitarian interpreting and is currently involved in developing uh, training resources for humanitarian interpreters in refugee settings. Is it correct, Emanuela? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, okay. so uh, after introducing uh, you, uh, I, um, I'm asking you to uh, share a, a, the general framework you are working on, please, so we, we can uh, go on uh, with the, the, the debate on the issues. Thank you. thank you, Joya. Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. Such a pleasure for me to be with you virtually today. And I'd like to thank Yulm for the invitation. As you said, I'd like to give you a quick overview of the current situation of Syrian refugees in Jordan. You, As you probably know, the civil war has been raging for more than 10 years now. We're in the 11th year. And uh, Jordan has been very generous so far. It has welcomed more than a million Syrian refugees, 1.3 million refugees. Of those, 670,000 are actually registered with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Interestingly, according to a recent survey run by UNHCR, 96% of Syrian refugees do not see themselves going back to their motherland anytime soon, or actually not at all. And that's pretty striking. This happens for a number of reasons. First of all, the regime is still in place. The situation there is pretty... Uh, dangerous for many, including many men who have deserted the army at the beginning of the civil war. There are human rights violations. So going back um, might actually entail the risk of being jailed. It's not safe for most Syrian refugees to go back. That means that many of them are stuck in a limbo in neighboring countries, including Jordan, for example. Interestingly, 80% of Syrian refugees living in Jordan are not in camps. This is something that might be surprising for, for, for many of us, but in fact, it's the minority of Syrian refugees that live in camps. Two camps are widely known, shall we say. One is Zatri, it's the biggest one, and also the first one to have been established. And then you have Azraq camp, which is home to 38,000 Syrian refugees and a few thousand Palestinian refugees. It was established in 2014 as, as an alternative to Zatri camp, which went quickly, completely overbooked, so to speak. It's also the under-resourced camp in the region. It doesn't have a great reputation. In fact, it is very strict in terms of, of regulations. I will show you in a minute what it looks like. I have brought a video produced and filmed by Care International, which is an international NGO that has been working with us since the beginning. So I hope to be able to show you what it looks and feels like in a minute. So Azra camp is managed, of course, by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And it's 
shall we say, a collaborative effort in terms of offering basic services. You have international NGOs such as CARE, such as uh, the IRC, and then you have natural NGOs. Life there is pretty stark. Refugees are given a monthly sum by the World Food Programme, which comes as a voucher so that they can purchase food at the local markets, and there's a few of them. In terms of work opportunities, again, the situation is pretty stark. Work, and op work opportunities are far and few between. There is something called the IBV scheme, so the incentive based scheme, which is run by UNACR, and it allows one person per, per household to have a job in the camp with national and international organizations. And this is a way to top up what they earn on a monthly basis through the food, uh, World Food Programme vouchers. So it's a way of improving one's life. But obviously, the minority of people work in a camp. It's around 30%. And um, when it comes to work opportunities in Jordan, up until recently, only a few sectors of the economy were open for blue-collar jobs, typically. So construction, agriculture, and sales. Now, recently, and this is good news, I would say, the Jordanian government has opened up other sectors of the economy so that Syrian refugees can have a chance to land the job in other sectors of the economy. And it has issued more than 62,000 new work permits. So there is hope, but obviously this comes 10 years after the beginning of the crisis, so there's still a lot to do. The University of Geneva in zone has been working in Azra camp since 2016. We have our own learning center, which I will show you uh, in a minute, thanks to the CARE uh, video. We believe that higher education is fundamental, not simply to improve one's uh, well-being and to have a, a new perspective on life, but also to increase one's chance to get a livelihood and I will talk about some of the opportunities that refugees have in a minute. So this is to set the scene. If we can play the video, I, I hope again you will have the chance to imagine what, what Azraq camp is like and what life in the camp is like. So if I can ask our wonderful collaborators at you to play the video, Thank you very much. I see it's about to start. So you will hear in the background noises from the camp. This is what life in the camp looks like. It's a stark environment. It's a desert-like environment. Temperatures in the summer reach 42 to 43 degrees. It's extremely dry. And yet life uh, and community life is quite vibrant you have schools obviously for the little ones primary schooling is uh, guaranteed thanks to unicef you have secondary schools as well you have uh, roads clearly crossing the camp uh, it's set up in villages there are several villages we are in village three as the in zone learning center as you can see the dominant color is white, uh, the shelters are pretty basic, and yet people are creative there. Uh, they take pride in uh, choosing the right outfit, colorful outfits uh, quite often. As you can see, there's uh, a lot of youth uh, going to school, going about uh, for their daily sort of errands. Mobility in the camp is pretty basic. You have bicycles that men can uh, can use. Women have a hard time when it comes to crossing the camp because, uh, culturally speaking, riding a bicycle for a woman is not considered to be the ideal situation. It's a different culture. Uh, in the video, you now see high school students going to school in the morning. And uh, 
obviously women bearing all sorts of, uh, of things uh, top of their head, including water uh, that they need as a daily as a daily uh, contribution to to home and domestic activities there's sport as well you have a few football fields you have basketball fields and obviously you have as i said education opportunities primary and secondary mainly there are several centers uh, run by UNICEF and by CARE, you have child care facilities. When it comes to higher education opportunities, the situation is pretty dramatic. And it's a light, nice transition leading to our learning center in Nasrak. This is a normal life, a normal day in our learning center. You have students coming in to register, obviously during the COVID uh, pandemic, health protection measures have been put in place. So students register, they take their laptop and they can enter one of the classrooms. And there they normally either study uh, individually using online learning tools and following online classes, or they form study groups. They're also given headsets so that they can listen to for example, language exercises. Collaborative learning is highly encouraged, something that we really insist on. And in a minute, uh, you will see a range of learners uh, in at our center. Obviously, a majority of them is young people finishing high school and looking for higher education opportunities, looking for a chance to go to university. But we have learners from all walks of life and all ages. To the left, there's Abdallah, the director of our learning center. He's a Syrian refugee, and he's talking to mature learners. We also cater to staff from national and international NGOs coming to our hub, for example, to learn English or to take other courses. And in a second, you'll get to see the learning hub from outside and our team. It's a snapshot of our team. And this, of course, is the end of the day. Laptops are safely stored. Some of them can be taken on loan to continue studying at home. And that's where we are. That's our team, of which we're very proud. So before uh, going back to our main topic, I'd like to just show you a couple of uh, slides that would give you an idea of our learning offer. So this is us, our students. We are currently present in two refugee camps. These are figures that you're probably familiar with in the world. The number of refugees is rapidly increasing and um, those who are in transit countries most often do not have opportunities. When it comes to higher education, 30% of the youth in the world can go to university, at least have an opportunity to do so. When it comes to refugees, the percentage is abysmal, is 3%, probably in Azraq, even less than that. This is us. So InZone is an academic center of the University of Geneva, focusing on higher education opportunities for refugees in camps. And obviously, we operate respecting the humanitarian principles. This is the two locations where we cur currently operate. We have a learning mini campus, uh, you may call it, in Azra camp and the other one in Kenya, in Kakuma. And these, uh, well, these are some of the subjects that we've um, uh, focused on in previous years when it comes to course uh, syllabi, I always say. And as you can see, there was no, prior to our meeting uh, you, uh, Joya, and the University of Lausanne through the Palma Cola Palmyra project, there was nothing 
to do with cultural heritage and archaeology. And uh, it has been for us a wonderful opportunity to work together to expand our horizon and to be able to offer something meaningful for Syrian refugees and something that would speak to them and to their cultural identity and cultural roots. So I think we can now close the uh, presentation. And I'd like to go back to uh, to the very beginning of our collaboration, uh, Joya. Now that the workshop series that you have run, Zoom Around Palmyra, is over, I can say uh, for us it's been a great success. The participants have shared their joy and enthusiasm of having that opportunity. It seems that uh, the Palmyra heritage really means a lot to them. So my question to you, I suppose, would be, how did you think uh, that a project really based on archaeology could contribute to the education of Syrian youth in Jordan? What was your thinking behind the Zoom Around Palmyra project? Uh, it was uh, maybe a crazy idea because it's not usual to think uh, about uh, using the past for uh, learning and education for the future. It's not so usual, um, especially in a context like this one, where maybe uh, more um, scientific and uh, practice uh, um, topics and subjects are uh, or seem to be more useful for uh, for young people, no, and so maybe uh, it was uh, like a bet this uh, this project. Anyway, um, the idea that uh, we we had uh, we Union University uh, talking with uh, the University of Lausanne uh, was uh, to to arise the baggage that these people had the cultural baggage baggage. Um, in, in general, what we observe is that uh, for a person, uh, his own cultural baggage is among the strongest and the most concrete things uh, that uh, those who live a country um, can take with them. Even though this baggage is not made up of physical objects, um, we, we are used to, to think uh, about culture as a, a surplus, as a, a luxury for uh, an elite as uh, something that we can live without, but uh, it's not like this. Uh, for example, the lockdown in 2020 has shown us that uh, is not the case. Uh, on the days that we were closed in, in our homes, uh, uh, in the grip of uncertainty and terror, we discovered that uh, uh, culture was uh, sustaining us and kept us alive. And uh, culture is constituted uh, of art, music, literature, cinema, theater, and also of, uh, of the art uh, of the past, of archaeology. And uh, culture was uh, a way for us to keep uh, uh, connected with the rest of the world, to continue communicating beyond physical borders. And so uh, we are now able to better understand that is also the case for refugees who have even left their homes, uh, that often lost their contacts uh, and have changed their point of reference in every respect. So um, now in their new homes, uh, these refugees uh, can have uh, invisible and apparently light baggage that is made up of culture, of memory, traditions, know-how, the so-called uh, intangible heritage. And uh, this is instead uh, a resource for them, a real treasure that only needs to be dusted off and exploited. So who better than an archaeologist can help you to acquire the tools uh, to discover your treasure. That was the, the question you, we, we moved from. And I'm not just playing a pun because archaeology is a discipline that provides a methodology for the study and understanding of the past through the analysis and the interpretation of data. 
And therefore, as I said at the beginning, it also constitutes a compass for the interpretation of the present, helping uh, to imagine our future. And uh, specifically, um, public archaeology uh, is very attentive to the interpretation of heritage through mechanism of public engagement and uh, through the possibilities of interaction with the peculiarities uh, of the contemporary context. So this uh, was uh, where we moved from in, uh, in, our, uh, in our project. Um, anyway, I know that working on uh, Syria's archaeological heritage is not so easy because uh, uh, you noted <laughs> at the beginning of the project that the, Many museums have been looted, many sites uh, were devastated by clandestine excavations, several monuments have been destroyed by terrorists, uh, and uh, it seems that there's uh, very little material evidence left. Uh, anyway, it is precisely because the war has reduced and damaged this baggage that we must do everything possible to return it to its uh, owner. Yeah, yeah I, I fully agree. And in fact, um, listening to what you're saying now, it strikes me that the refugees that have taken part in the workshop that you have organized can basically be split into two groups. One group had actually seen Palmyra. Some of them actually come from that city and they had a pretty vivid image of what Pamara uh, looked like. And then another group of refugees, either from other regions of, of, of Syria or uh, basically too young to have had the opportunity of seeing Palmyra, had no, obviously no memory, no recollection whatsoever. So going back to what you were just saying, yes, culture is part of our identity and it's not something optional. In fact, in difficult times, culture is just as important as our basic needs. Once the basic needs are met, that's what we really feel strongly about. And yet, there is this uh, additional, I think, layer of complexity when it comes to Syrian refugees in that they're displaced. And Palmyra, that sort of cultural heritage was destroyed. And some will never get the chance to see it, will never get the chance to experience it. So I guess my question to you would be, listen to what you were saying, what, what concrete solutions have you found to sort of restored contact between Syrians and the heritage that they have lost, bearing in mind that some of them have actually never seen it, never had the chance to experience it? Mm -hmm. um, there are many solutions. Uh, in general, um, all the academics uh, are trying now to uh, restore this uh, relationship between uh, people and the heritage uh, through digital tools. And uh, these tools such as uh, um, reconstruction, uh, digital reconstructions with uh, uh, 3D printers, uh, uh, for, for example, um, no, digital reconstructions on, uh, <laughs> on the web and uh, models, uh, 3D models that can be exploited by 3D printers and uh, are surely you will very useful uh, for these people. And in fact, uh, uh, I know that you, you are also uh, working uh, on, uh, on this uh, on these on these issues uh, anyway um, the idea we had uh, was to um, to try to make uh, also a, um, a how can I can I, I explain like a, a, a mental and psychological reconstruction also so uh, we tried to restore the meaning that these monuments had uh, for the people in the past and the meaning that uh, this monument can have for people in the present. And uh, th th this uh, must uh, imply a long process uh, of, uh, of studying 
uh, the, the monuments uh, and their histories. So we tried uh, to do uh, a storytelling with these people and to involve uh, the, the young refugees of the Azraq in this uh, uh, storytelling um, experience. Uh, because public engagement was really important for, uh, for us. Um, the idea, in fact, is uh, that uh, um, they, they must uh, uh, feel to be uh, custodians of this heritage in the future. And uh, it's very important that they feel that it's their own heritage, first of all, and not uh, only a world, uh, a world heritage like uh, UNESCO said. Uh, because uh, this is uh, the, the very uh, important question. And um, what solution we, we, we found? Uh, a very um, practical solution, uh, just to dedicate time to this heritage and to these people. Uh, it's not easy today to find time for, uh, for people, time for product, uh, because we are in a very fast uh, world. And uh, we encouraged uh, the young uh, people of Azraq to work on the cultural heritage of Palmyra, to build something with it. And uh, we, we also have exploited digital technologies, but we have not limited ourselves uh, to creating a digital object uh, and um, abandoning this object in a virtual space. Uh, we have made um, a journey with, uh, with uh, the boys and the girls of uh, Azraq together to give uh, uh, this heritage a shape. We have animated it um, with uh, thoughts and emotions, and we have built a story around this heritage. Uh, we delivered this story to the public uh, uh, together with an, an explanation, and uh, this is our a booklet uh, sorted out from this uh, project, a booklet that everyone can get and can read. And uh, this is how the, the project uh, Zoom Around Palmyra that we conducted in collaboration with you and uh, with the University of Lausanne uh, was born. And uh, this project uh, originated from the desire to um, conduct an experimentation on the possibility of co-building uh, informative material with, um, with people, uh, with local people. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that was uh, really important for, for us because um, archaeologists often have a presumption of being uh, the only interpreters of the monuments uh, they bring to light. But uh, in reality, um, they do a good job only if they can make sure that the message uh, is uh, understandable to all the men of the people. Hmm? Uh, to, 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 all, um, to all the people all around the world, I mean. And uh, thus they, they must not only speak an understandable language, but they also must refer to the same cultural horizons of, uh, of their public. Mm? Uh, and this is the way how the monuments of the past can uh, have a new life in the present. If I, if I may, I think that's uh, incredibly interesting. If I can add something about the language that I mentioned, which is probably linked to my own background, I'm a conference interpreter, and InZone considers multilingual uh, learning as particularly important. And I think what you said uh, ties in very well with this idea that knowledge should be communicated, including knowledge about uh, the archaeological past, in, um, in the student's own language. And I think uh, we have made an effort together to make sure that the refugees that you worked with uh, were able to understand all of uh, the learning materials and and the actual classes in their in Arabic in their own native language, and we've been able to do so thanks to interpreters that we have trained, who are 
on site. And yes, there have been technical difficulties and connectivity issues, but what was important for us is to make sure that people could learn in their own native language, which I think ties in very well to what you just said. Uh, you, you've got to speak the, the local language, and this only also includes uh, the cultural dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wanted to contribute uh, that, that we, we believe that a multilingual learning environment is, is essential. And yes, English is very important. English is the, the global language. And yet, when you really want to speak to people, you've got to be able to speak in their language, and you've got to be able to understand a little bit about the cultural context. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, your contribution, in fact, to this project was uh, essential because uh, without you as uh, interpreters and not only under the linguistic aspect was uh, uh, exceptional for us. And uh, we were able to, to pro produce something that uh, was valuable for the, uh, these people, I guess. And um, so now I, I would like to present uh, uh, the first yes, let's see. <laughs> uh, tool that we uh, produced uh, uh, together with the University of Lausanne that was the editor of the, this booklet in uh, Arabic, a new version of a booklet they uh, uh, realized uh, uh, before in English and that, uh, that was now updated with the new illustrations that we prepared uh, uh, during uh, uh, a workshop in Azraq, and uh, we developed uh, thanks to Dr. Santa um, Barbara Santagostini, that uh, uh, was a collaborator of Ulm University, that uh, uh, created the graph the new graphics of the of the booklet and uh, all the um, all the illustrations uh, uh, that can uh, explain uh, the text of the of the booklet. Um, so, mm, before uh, uh, sharing the, my slides, uh, and uh, I'm asking uh, uh, Lorenzo to <laughs> show uh, my PowerPoint, please. Okay, thank you. Um, before sharing uh, and commenting these slides with the presentation of uh, uh, this booklet and of this project, I would like to um, say thank you to uh, Dr. Patrick Michel of the University of Lausanne, that is the head of the Collar Palmyre project. And thanks to him, uh, the Zoom Around Palmyra project took shape. It was a collaboration, uh, becoming a part of a series of pedagogical activities uh, that the University of Lausanne conducted in Azraq. And uh, these activities uh, were, were, of course, related uh, to the archaeological heritage of Palmyra. So working together on this topic, we uh, created uh, a new uh, part of this uh, huge project they, they are working on. And uh, I also would like to thank you, Emma, for this opportunity and uh, also to Lupisani for supporting us uh, through the journey and giving us the opportunity to work uh, with your uh, in-zone uh, learning hub managers, teachers, and tutors in uh, Azraq. So I remember Abdullah Salim, Omran Al-Mansur, Mohamed Ba. And uh, last but not least, I would like to thank the guys uh, who enthusiastically participated uh, in the project. Mm. Uh, so uh, in the first slide, I show you uh, the flyer of the of a workshop that uh, was the basis uh, for uh, public participation, public engagement, and uh, the realization of uh, of the the booklet. Um, we ah, I, I remember that this booklet uh, is available in English and uh, in Arabic, and uh, was distributed in Azraq, so you can see. Uh, the, the guys of Azraq uh, with the, the students with uh, their, uh, their booklets and their uh, artworks uh, in, uh, in their end. And also um, a digital version of this booklet uh, is available for the, to the public for free and can be downloaded in uh, the website of the Collar Palmyre project. Um, 
So, uh, to gain our goal of public participation uh, in the editorial process uh, of an archaeological booklet uh, with an educational purpose, during the autumn of 2021, we carried out uh, for a group of uh, young Syrians aged 1825 uh, a workshop of digital art that was called uh, Zoomer on Palmyra. This workshop uh, was inspired by the history and the monuments uh, uh, of uh, the more famous archaeological site of Syria. And uh, we collected all their feedbacks on this topic uh, in order to adapt the graphics and the iconographic system of the booklet to their curiosity and uh, to their need uh, for an immediate comprehension of the text. Uh, for example, in the next uh, slide, uh, Okay, you can see some illustrations that uh, Barbara Sant'Agostini produced uh, for this booklet. Uh, and uh, um, you can uh, guess and, uh, uh, some uh, monuments uh, of Palmyra, uh, such as uh, the Temple uh, of Bell that uh, uh, was converted in a, an icon for uh, so an easy recognizable monument. Uh, converted into an icon and uh, also um, in this booklet there were many other monuments that were destructed such as the temple of Balsamin, the tower tombs, uh, the theater so we <laughs> reduced them to icons to uh, to make them easily recognizable to uh, to students and um, also we put uh, the attention on uh, um, other uh, figures that are aimed to remember the close connection between the work of the archaeologists uh, and uh, what we know about the history of the site. And um, so you can uh, also find in this booklet um, statues, pottery, coins, small finds, inscriptions uh, that are very useful to reconstruct the history uh, of the site and to give a full rounded interpretation uh, of the past. This is very relevant uh, today and uh, that we have lost uh, a direct contact uh, with these uh, materials because they are dispersed in the collections of the world, they are uh, uh, distracted, looted, and so uh, we need uh, to, uh, to see <laughs> uh, directly uh, these, uh, these objects. Uh, and we try to do to do that. Um, so, going up to the next uh, slide, uh, I show you some of the monuments that were uh, destructed and are are not visible uh, anymore um, in uh, in relation with uh, their place in Palmyra on uh, a map that uh, was uh, realized for. Uh, for this uh, booklet. Um, we played during this workshop with uh, the pictures of, of the monuments, uh, and we really played with them, paying a special attention to the meaning of, uh, of these monuments. Um, in fact, even if they are not uh, visible, they, or even if they can be appreciated only through a 3D model, they continue to live carrying on the messages that the ancient uh, inhabitants of the city left to their successor. So we played with the stories of, this, of these monuments, uh, with the um, uh, kind of storytelling that we made uh, with uh, our, uh, our students. And um, the memory of this ancient uh, melting pot that was uh, Palmyra, where people from uh, uh, from Europe, from uh, uh, the Middle East, from the East, uh, uh, were all together. Um, uh, is, uh, the memory of, of Palmyra uh, collects a huge amount of, uh, of stories that concern the themes of peace and dialogue between different cultures and uh, still speaks uh, to the people all around the world. So everyone can assume a different meaning according to uh, personal feelings and to a specific cultural background. So uh, it's uh, what we said before, no? we, we must refer 
to the personal background of people when uh, uh, dealing with cultural heritage. And uh, we asked, uh, what's the meaning of this heritage for the young Syrians, for those who uh, have seen it and for those who never had the possibility to see it? Mm -hmm. uh, we asked them this, uh, this question and we invited them to give an answer through digital art. So art of the present, illustrating the perception, the ideas, the emotions inspired by the art of the past and serving as a mean to imagine the future. So the idea was to imagine the, the, in the future through the emotions uh, uh, of, of uh, the art of the past. Uh, we use photography, of course, to do that, since uh, we can't uh, access these monuments. Uh, remember th that photography is uh, a kind of art. So uh, through photography, we can mix uh, past and present because we can put together different things that uh, uh, can be touched and not. And uh, through photography, we can also mix what we see and what we think. Uh, and uh, photography also helps to keep memory of a moment, to evoke the feeling of the fresh breeze among the palm trees, uh, as you can see on the top. Uh, and uh, digital photo composition techniques, uh, uh, such as those you can see on, uh, on the right, uh, also help to, to give a personal interpretation uh, of this memory. Uh, mixing these, uh, these images. Um, on, on the bottom, you can see an example of a uh, photo composition, <laughs> a collage on a Syrian banknote. Now there are different the banknotes that are used in Syria, but uh, maybe someone uh, saw them before. So they can immediately recognize what is a collage and uh, uh, how symbols can be used to create something very evocative. Um, through digital colleges, we can play with images, uh, exploring the intangible and giving a visual consistency to the products of our imagination. Um, like using a camera zoom, during the creation of a collage, we can emphasize a detail and create a narrative around it. That's what we, we try to do with, the, with these monuments on, on, on the right, to create an history, a new history with the monument. And so even if Palmyra today seems like an unreachable and forgotten place, digital tools allows us to zoom around it with a quick change of perspective. On the next slide, I will show the digital tools we use to create uh, uh, this um, photo composition. Uh, through um, weekly meetings with the students of ASRAC, uh, meetings uh, on Zoom, of course. Uh, I hope in the future we can uh, move to ASRAC uh, <laughs> and uh, maybe visit it and uh, work uh, directly with, uh, with the students. Um, so this was a whiteboard we used to collect all the, the, the thoughts of the, uh, and the presentations of the, of the students. Um, it's a, a tool of, uh, for visual communication that we, we use, it's uh, named uh, uh, Mural. Uh, here they present them, them, themselves through images, since we were working on images, and took confidence with teamwork on visual collaboration platform that is really useful for them for uh, working in the future, mm, to have confidence with a, a collaboration platform. And uh, we put them, we, we, we put there all the um, available uh, photos, uh, some keywords, some useful links uh, to digital archives, uh, such as uh, the Collar archive of, of uh, photographs on, uh, on Palmyra. And we also put there our agenda. Then we use another digital tool uh, that is uh, a free software for photo composition, that is uh, GIMP, is an open source uh, uh, software uh, really close to Photoshop, so it's also very useful for working uh, on uh, pictures and create uh, graphics. Uh, 
and uh, every student uh, freely employed uh, his artistic touch uh, to express uh, his perception on, uh, on the heritage of Palmyra, combining the images of the monuments before their destruction, such as the tetrapylon that you can see here, and uh, uh, other symbols or emotional elements uh, to create uh, a surreal landscape, both expressing feelings uh, about themselves and their country home and formulating uh, uh, their hope uh, for the, the future. So these were two instruments um, very practical that we tried to, uh, to teach them how to use. Um, let me finish <laughs> and close with um, this uh, overview of the works that uh, the students of uh, Azraq, uh, Azraq produced uh, during the workshop. And um, they are all uh, presented into the, the booklet, so you can see them again uh, if you want. And uh, my hope for the, for the future is to show them in a, an exhibition, maybe, <laughs> uh, traveling around the world. Uh, the first uh, of this uh, work uh, is um, made by uh, Batu Lesan Al Khalil, um, and uh, she tried to represent what she calls the land of civilizations. Um, she created a melting pot of iconic monuments from the world. So uh, the monumental arc of Palmyra still standing, not dis destructed, um, and. Uh, this arc embraces the liberty and enlightening the world uh, of New York. Um, and uh, this is a, an important monument because uh, this statue used to welcome people arriving in New York from the East. So uh, there's a, a migration of people connected to this, uh, to this statue. Uh, in the wild, you can see a group of tourists that uh, admire um, this, uh, this combination of monuments uh, standing between the Giza pyramids uh, uh, in the foreground and the, the Eiffel Tower in the background. So we have a very particular mix. Uh, Batul observed that Palmyra deserves more than what it suffers in terms of destruction and devastations. Uh, and uh, her work is an attempt uh, to, to see uh, it, uh, all this heritage, in its best uh, uh, way. The next uh, work uh, is by Fatima Khalif al Duesh that produced an unusual winter landscape of Palmyra, enlightening uh, some elements of the Bedouin culture that still nowadays are relevant to qualify the city. A hunting falcon on the top uh, 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 of the tower tomb of Elabel, blown uh, up in uh, 2015, and uh, a typical desert plant, a cactus, just beside it. Then we have a tent on the right, similar to those hosting the Bedouins who used to live close to the archaeological site, like the child in the foreground. Fatima imagines that he will spend some time talking and playing with the tourists on the right, and that in case of rain, the tower will be a safe shelter for both. Then, the picture by Hiba Isal Saleh is full of pathos. She is uh, from Palmyra, so she wanted to recreate the atmosphere uh, of the places of her childhood. That's why in the sky over the arc, you can see some colored balloons. On the foreground, a statue of the Queen Zenobia by the most distinguished female sculptor in America during the 19th century, Harriet Osmer, recalls the pride of the modern inhabitants of Palmyra for the glorious legacy she left them. Some pigeons are flying over uh, her crown, waiting for peace. So this is a, a strong message and, uh, for peace. Then we have uh, Nibal Mohamed Alamar that entitled her work Palmyra in the Past, Present and Future, combining elements representing different aspects of Palmyra in different times. So you can uh, see the prestige of its history and of its amazing monuments, such as the theater in the background, the, violent, the violence of the destruction 
and the hope for a future where modernity combines with a traditional lifestyle in a desert full of people and crossed by camels, cars and tourists. Water in the foreground indicates that life can return to the land of Palmyra again. So, water, life. <laughs> Omar Farhan Al-Zubi chose to populate uh, the Great Colony District uh, with tourists, journalists and press photographers from different countries around the world. He hopes that they could visit Palmyra again. Omar lived not so far from Palmyra and his dream is to study journalism and the media in order to be able to dialogue with the people and convey them pictures and news about its cultural heritage. In his picture, Omar also puts some elements suggesting the free circulation of people and information, a topic that is really important nowadays, also in Europe. So you can see a seagull, symbol of freedom, a camel, symbol of the ancient means of transportation, and a career pigeon, um, once upon a time used to exchange messages. Last, we have a very romantic picture by Maisun Mahmoud Al Khatib that commented her work with these words. With my humble artistic touch, I made this representation of the vivid image that fills my eyes when the word Palmyra comes to mind. Palm trees are very important in Palmyra. In fact, you can find them also in its name. The sunset is an essential in our life. Its suggestive light could play a great difference in our perception of reality, making it more beautiful. So with this uh, nice uh, picture, I, I close the presentation of the, of the workshop and of this uh, experience. And I would like to ask a comment by Emanuela on this uh, work because I know she loves it. What an amazing gallery. I think all of the students' works we've seen are quite remarkable. And I can certainly witness to the fact that I have seen, seldom have I seen so much enthusiasm for a project. Now, the works that you've shared with the audience uh, were made by youngsters, high school leavers, boys and girls, probably thinking about their cultural past and cultural heritage from that perspective for the very first time. And they were thrilled, thrilled uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, because they got a chance to get to know more about Palmyra. For some of them, like I said, uh, it was a first. They'd never visited the place before. And then a few, quite a few, discovered a particular set of interests that uh, were never quite stimulated before. For example, uh, I have in mind this young guy who told me I'd like to become a graphic designer one day. Uh, another guy told me I really love to study this, uh, perhaps at university level. I'd, I'd love to be an archaeologist one day. And another girl told me I'd love to be able to learn the skills to share this with the rest of the world. So perhaps either become a cultural journalist or a writer. So you see, that was a, really a golden opportunity for them to get to know more about their cultural past and roots, but also to look into the future to sort of discover something new in themselves. And I hope that there will be more to come, that we can st still work together on follow-up projects, because I feel that we've just scraped the surface. There's an iceberg, yeah. <laughs> really, just the tip of the iceberg. There's all the rest of it uh, to be discovered and and uh, unearthed, I suppose, if we wanted to use a metaphor. So from from our end, uh, there's there's a lot of gratitude, really, and uh, an enthusiasm for for what's to come. <laughs> Yes, but um, what was uh, your reaction to, to the idea of working uh, on an academic project uh, focusing on archaeology? I want to know that also. Thank you for your question. It's an interesting <laughs> one. At the beginning, I feared that this would be a bit of a leap in the dark for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, we run regular surveys um, in the camp 
to know what students are interested in, potential students. And the usual responses are, we want to learn coding, we want to learn something practical, we want to learn something, some skill sets that would lead to a job. So I feared in the beginning that we would not raise enough interest. And then we had never tried anything of the kind before. Like I said, cultural heritage, history, uh, archaeology, that was all new to us. But the minute we shared the news via a leaflet in, in the camp, in Village 3, we got, we got tons of responses. Because we didn't uh, necessarily know that Palmyra would be of such resonance to them. But the minute you say Palmyra, you have an immediate response of interest of, I suppose it's a bit like uh, we feel about the Coliseum in Rome. It's mm -hmm. just part of who we are, even though we, some of us have never been to Rome. So it was an immediate uh, positive response. And then the project only confirmed uh, the, the, the initial interest. So it was a surprise for me. Let's put it that way, a positive one. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, I hope uh, we can have the chance to follow, to have a follow-up of this project. And uh, I also hope that uh, people following us today uh, can have uh, an idea uh, of the role of, uh, uh, of archaeology, of public archaeology, also in a, an humanitarian context that is not so... Uh, easy to guess, but anyway, uh, we tested uh, uh, and uh, we experimented uh, a new experience, and uh, I think that uh, it uh, carried out uh, great results. So I'm very happy about that, and uh, I also want to say thank you uh, once more to you and uh, all uh, all the staff from the University of Lausanne, also, and uh, of of course. Uh, the in-zone learning hub of Azraq and all the people working with you. So thank you very much, Emma, for being with us today. And uh... thank you very much for inviting me. A big thank you to our partners, the University of Lausanne. A huge thank you to our local team in Azraq, to our interpreters, to our students. And uh, finally, big thank you to, to you, Joya, and uh, your institution for offering this golden opportunity. Like I said, uh, we hope there's more to come. <laughs> okay. So, bye and see you soon in the next uh, Yule Flow. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.